Uh, so after my keynote around whole school transformation, which was a big download of the key points from across four years worth of work, this time around I'm hoping to be a little less overwhelming in my approach and to offer you some insight into one practical component. Um, so that is unpacking with you one of the most common processes that occurs for students with disability being personalised planning. So the purpose, development, title and importance of such plans differs across educational systems and sectors right around the nation. Some call them individual education plans, others individual support plans. In Queensland, student planning is broken into a variety of sub-plans that fill different purposes such as personalised learning, support provisions and individual curriculum plans. In some states and systems, they are mandatory and are required to draw down targeted funding and resources. In other instances, not so much. However, regardless of these nuanced differences, there is a place for personalised planning. And who contributes, how they are situated, and what they aim to achieve is vital to establishing and framing that place, particularly when it comes to inclusive practices. Before we get started though, I'd like you to take a moment to think about the most recent time that you have been involved in a personalised planning scenario. Who were you planning for? What role did you play? Why were you doing the planning? Did you feel comfortable with the planning process? And what was the outcome? Is the plan still current and at the forefront? So I'll give you a few moments to consider these points. Once you've had a bit of a think, I would then like you to turn to the person or persons next to you and share your most recent experiences of personalised planning. And you may like to use the same questions um, to drive that discussion. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that now amongst yourselves. Given the variety of attendees that we have, I'm hoping that you are able to share and hear some different experiences and perspectives. And it was fortunate that we had the IEP experience that Jody shared earlier as well, which gave some insight in what that process can look and feel like um, for some parents. So on screen you will see my thoughts and experiences regarding personalised planning prior to the mindset and culture shift that occurred at our school and what I experienced in previous settings where inclusion wasn't yet high on the agenda. It was always about accountability, compliance, documenting the deficit, highlighting responsibility and responses that were built from presumption and stereotypes. They were time consuming and even after all of that work they were filed away and rarely looked at or referred to unless needed for some form of proof that we were doing something to support the student. Teachers found them difficult to connect with, particularly in a high school setting where they see multiple classes of students sporadically across a timetable. The ideas I or other special education teachers came up with were the ideal of supports and services that would benefit the student, but they weren't contextual or realised at the practice level because of the disconnect between the planner and plan, student and plan and teacher and plan. Our inclusive schooling transformation, we actually took a step back from personalised planning. We took a deliberate rest pause to provide us opportunity to A, see what would unfold and what planning would actually be needed, and B, to give us an opportunity to reflect on the purpose and how that could be in, improved moving forward. Purpose is the key word there, and in fact it is one of the key words and motivators that drives all of the work that we do around inclusive schooling. Purpose, belonging and culture. Our three points of reference for every decision and way of working. Does this have and or provide purpose? Is it going to strengthen belonging and acceptance? And does it contribute to the culture and outcome we are aiming to achieve? We ask these questions often and when we encounter a problem of practice or a negative impact, we point to the point of deficit can always be linked to an oversight or disconnect to one or more of these key points. Being reflective and considerate of this then gives us a solutions road out. I know that some in the audience may be pondering, but how do you have the flexibility to take that initial step back? Well, in Queensland, personalised plans aren't mandatory. A different process is used to determine the allocation of resourcing. And we don't receive resourcing based on individual students. We receive it as an overall bucket. 
However, personalised plans are still commonly used because of what they can provide. For those in systems where they are mandated, you still have some options. Being mandated may be the reason you do the plan, but it doesn't have to be the purpose. You can frame the purpose however you like. You would have to do this reflection and contemplation while still maintaining your current processes, but purpose is contextual and responsive. So you do still have some options around how personalised planning is conducted and regarded in your school. And in all reality, a plan does not support make. Just because something isn't written doesn't mean it isn't happening. And just because it is written doesn't mean that it is. Personalised plan uh, learning plans actually sit within the bigger principle of planning for personalised learning. We have obligation and direction around this which sits at the legislation level. The planning for personalised learning and support, a national resource, falls out of the disability standards for education. It articulates that schools have a responsibility for maximising the outcomes and well-being of all students and for providing access to high quality education. The standards set out to ensure that students with disability can access and participate in education on the same basis as all other students. For this to be achieved, educators need to provide personalised learning that aims to fulfil the diverse capabilities of each student. This is consistent with the principles embodied in human rights and in the Melbourne Declaration on Educational Goals for Young Australians. As a result, quality differentiated teaching and learning should be the baseline for all students. This differentiation should be responsive to formative data about real-time student need and should sit alongside teaching and learning experiences that are clearly aligned to the curriculum and general capabilities, therefore supporting all students to access and participate. We see this flow from the DSE into the EITSL standards of a proficient teacher and into the Australian curriculum and design and implementation provisions. This line of sight sets the standard, the ground zero of practice, and therefore schools should be developing and utilising consistent pedagogical approaches that capture this ground zero in general day-to-day -day teaching and learning. In turn, capturing and responding to the majority of students' student need as the default. This record of personalised learning should be evident in every teacher's planning and execution and does not necessarily need to equate to individual concrete plans for all students. Beyond this scope, however, exist functional impacts that require the response of individualised adjustments and modifications. Although these may still be picked up and catered for within well-designed lessons, they are usually non-negotiables that either have the power to restrict or enable a student to learn. Therefore, it is at this level that we then branch out into personalised planning such as ISPs and ISPs. At Tharangawa, we create personalised learning plans for students who are captured under the nationally consistent collection data categories of supplementary, substantial and extensive. We don't do them based on labels. We use this same process to inform the need to improve our ground zero and to truly reflect on whether the needs of a student are reflective of them or reflecting of the teaching quality that they experience. From this process, we have found that a number of students actually need to fall out of the supplementary category and even some changes from substantial down to supplementary and extensive down to substantial. As our connection to that line of sight previously mentioned improves, so does the outcomes of our students. Highlighting a direct relationship between teaching quality and the impacts experienced by students. So with all that in mind, let's apply the purpose, belonging and cultural lens to the personalised learning process. The purpose should be about setting up equity of access, participation and opportunity. It should be about supporting educational outcomes of the student that align with the vision of the student and their inclusion as active, valued and contributing members of society. It shouldn't be about deficit. It should be about identifying the key impacts and barriers and respectfully planning to overcome those so deficits aren't the result. In regards to belonging, the planning process and its outcomes should reflect acceptance. It shouldn't pl place onus or blame or try to fix. There should be a strong sense of value and worth 
and that the value and worth can be extended to contribution in age-appropriate, dignified ways. The plan should be focused on strengthening connections with teachers and peers in inclusive environments and experiences. Personalised planning should come from a culture of wanting to plan the student in, not plan them out. It is about having a genuine interest in the student and their outcomes and supporting them to engage and to have a positive schooling experience. So to bring the embodiment of purpose, belonging and culture to life, this is the process that is undertaken at Tharangawa. The first instance is to capture student voice and input. The plan is after all about them, so they should be active contributors. We do this by capturing data through a profile that asks students to contribute responses around their interests, likes, dislikes, their values, and what things they have difficulty with, the strategies and supports that they find beneficial, and what information they want teachers to know about them. This process is adjusted and modified to suit the way in which the student communicates best. So some students write, some verbalise, and some use pictures similar to the process that we just went through with John. We then look at functional impacts. We do this collaboratively. So we ask teachers to list up to three main impacts that they observe and then up to three main strategies that have been highly effective. We ask parents to provide input and also any broader stakeholders that are involved. We combine this data with the voice captured from the student and develop a list of very key educational impacts for the student. Analyzing the impacts, we then look at what whole school and whole class responses are already in place and what could be put in place to reduce the necessity for individualized responses. This is a commitment to universal design at the whole school and whole class level. After that, we then establish what additional individualised supports are then necessary to complement or supplement whole school and whole class design. We then formally document and communicate the plan to all stakeholders, including the student, and receive feedback before publishing. We then follow on to collaboratively reflect and review in cycles to ensure the plan actually equates to positive practice and response and to make sure that it is achieving the outcomes that the student is desiring. We no longer develop goals, you know, ones that say things like, by the end of term two, Jenny will write full sentences with correct punctuation. <laughs> this is because the goal should always be a progression in learning and a progression that doesn't have a cap. Remember the point about the baseline, the ground zero of teaching? The student should be engaging in teaching and learning that is progressing them from where they are toward the outcomes and achievement standard that is developmentally appropriate at all times. Students without disability don't have these lists of presumptuous goals. Their goal is learning. So why should a student with a disability have something that is so prescriptive and punitive? If you're going to list a goal, like the example given about Jenny, you really need to then list all of the things that are going to be learnt. What you will find is that you end up with a list, you end up listing out a whole curriculum achievement standard and the general capabilities, which as I said, is the ground zero for all students anyway. Again, think of the purpose of the culture and think about the line of sight that rigorous learning is in fact the goal and should therefore be evident and embodied throughout the entire plan, not just listed as separate. Quality pedagogy involves engaging, engaging students in input and output that is responsive at all times and is informed by formative data collected every lesson to then drive the student forward. So the end product looks a little something like this. The key focus is the vision, strengths and interests of the learner. We then see a list of functional impacts that have been categorised into areas and agreed upon by all collaborative stakeholders. Next to this is a list of ways that address these impacts at a whole class level. The standards of practice that are inclusive and responsive universally to our entire school context. As the school's inclusive transformation progresses, this list grows. You will see throughout that the standards of practice outweigh the need for individualised supports which sit in the last column. 
For example, it is now the minimum expectation at our school that teachers will engage in collaborative alignment of curriculum. They will identify literacy nu and numeracy demands and work together on how to differentiate these to allow authentic access for all students from the outset. They will use Bloom's taxonomy to plan out learning that builds on knowledge and understanding progressively. They will use explicit instruction to deliver learning that is modelled and guided through active and interactive processes. And they will incorporate a focus activity and a brain break into every lesson to support attention of all students. They will provide flexible seating and sensory tool options and they will enact the principles of positive behaviour for learning as their classroom management process. Lots and lots more that has progressively built up as the capability has increased and the culture strengthened. So in summary, when engaging in personalised planning, think about the why. Do you need to rethink the purpose and framing of the process? Does the input invested actually equate to the intended output? And who's checking? How are you sure? Or is there a lot of investment for not a lot of positive action and outcome? Who is representing the I? Is it a teacher sitting in an office? A group of adults talking? Or is it actually the student from their experience and their perspective? And what can you improve? There is always something to improve. I'm still not 100% content with the process at Tharangawa, but is it, it is a journey and when we know better, we do better. And we capacity build to ensure that the students' outcomes are always at the forefront, not the status quo and not what we as adults are comfortable with. Thank you.